All right, so good afternoon. This is Dr. David Raymond from the Virginia Cyber Range, and we're diving into a new semester of, um, of weekly workshops. So we're gonna start out the semester with um, this discussion of uh, reconnaissance and network scanning, and, and um, I'll introduce that particular topic um, when we get to it in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> First, I'm gonna, uh, Start out with overview of the weekly workshop, right? So um, I throw this slide up every time. Cover, coverage of um, cybersecurity education topics uh, each week, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Uh, I think most of our traction comes from folks uh, um, listening to the recorded versions of these, which is great. Uh, hopefully f folks get some, some value out of it. Um, yeah, so a trick I learned from everybody out there probably already knows this, but a trick I learned from my kids is you can watch, um, you know, video. You can watch YouTube videos at like one and a half speed or double speed, um, and I tend to talk kind of slow. So you probably um, watch all these at double speed and be just fine. You get the hour out of the way in thirty minutes. Um, anyway, so um, Tuesdays at one p.m. and recorded, posted on our website, uh, Maureen. Uh, here in our office, um, takes care of that for us, does great work. Um, and if you'd like to see a particular topic, email us. So you can send an email to me, um, or you can send an email to contact at virginiacyberrange.org and we'll add your thing to the list. We're going we're gonna to start out the semester talking about some network scanning, recon kinds of things, and then I think we're going to spend some time delving into um, capture the flag to related topics. Um, for a good part of the term. So uh, that's something to look forward to. So I, as I always do, I'm gonna start out with a couple of items of recent news. This one I thought was sort of interesting. This is um, <clears throat> from uh, last month actually. Um, so uh, 3D printed heads, let hackers and cops unlock your phone. So the story here is that a group um, ran an experiment where they, um, it used a couple of different 3D printing techniques to print out basically heads, right? Printing out people's heads and then seeing if they could use people's heads or their faces to unlock um, phones uh, that use, or perhaps I guess they were focused on phones in this particular experiment, unlock phones that use biometric authentication, that use face, face ID basically. And <clears throat> so, um, you know, the, the face ID is um, is good in that it generally it would not get fooled with like a photograph, right? So so you show a photograph to a 3D or to a face recognition uh, uh, system and, and generally it the, the, vo the, the face recognition system realizes that that's a two-dimensional image and, it, and um, it's looking for a three-dimensional thing to scan. And so that, do that generally does not work. Um, so then, you know, these these uh, folks th thought, well, maybe if we maybe if we could, you know, create a, a 3D sort of photograph, right? Let's take this and do it in 3D and see if that works. And and <clears throat> so they they printed this th printed the the heads using a 3D printer. And this is this picture on the left is a picture from the news story. It was on um, uh, originally reported on on Forbes, I guess. And and it's I pulled it off this version of the story from uh, this website TechCrunch. Um, and so this is not the 3D printer that you probably have in your high schools or, or you know, local maker spaces or whatever. Um, you know, most, most uh, consumer 3D printers use plastic filament that's in a spool and, it's, and it does this additive manufacturing thing where it lays out a layer at a time um, in, in plastic. Now there are some newer 3D printers that print with some more exotic materials. This particular kind of a 3D printer that they use in this experiment is, is different than that. It's actually um, layering layers of gypsum and then using a laser to solidify those layers of gypsum. So it's a little bit different than, the, than a spool of stuff that's, that's, um, that's, you know, spreading, you know, that's heating up the material and then, you know, expecting the material to cool quickly on, uh, as the next layer of the thing. So a little bit different 3D printing technology than maybe you're used to, but this is a, you know, this is a, a um, you know, fairly widely used 3D printing technique. And so what they did was they, t they took, you know, a, a photograph of um, this person's head from different angles and they um, 
were able to turn that into a 3D image, 3D file, uh, and then they were able to print that, print it, and, and then they did some cleanup. So here they're sort of cleaning it up, and they like painted. I guess they paint, did some painting to make the uh, you know hair dark and eyebrows dark and that kind of stuff. Um, and then they tested that that particular you know that 3D printed head against a variety of different um, telephones that use. Um, that use Face ID, and uh, as it turned out in this particular experiment, it worked on all the Android phones that they tested. Did not work on on the iPhone. So the the newest iPhone, the iPhone 10, is the one that uses Face ID, and apparently it didn't work on the iPhone 10. Um, you know, it's in it. You know, I, I assume that you know the iPhone 10 just does a, does its facial recognition perhaps in a slightly different way. Um, it's probably not hugely more secure. It's just this particular experiment happened to work differently um, on these two different technologies. And, and um, anyway, I think it's I think it's sort of clever approach, right? So as we um, as we use different kinds of technologies for for authentication, right? So this is so, so the authentication step is what you do to um, decide if somebody has author, authorized access to a, to a um, device or system. And, you know, historically the password has been the authentication technique. And so, you know, that's, that's from the early days of computing systems. And, you know, really in the early days, the authentication step was less about um, trying to verify somebody was who they said they were. And it was more about just being able to assign um, computing time to specific individuals, right? So, so, um, you know, because because early early computer systems were uh, basically they're you know mainframe based, and you had to assign how much computing time was used by any individual so that you could bill them for that computing time, and so the username password was used for really for billing purposes. Now it's used for for you know security to secure data, um, and you know people have talked a lot recently about you know what we want to get beyond the password. You know passwords. We there's all kinds of difficulties with passwords. You know it's hard to get users to create strong passwords if they do create strong passwords that are hard to remember. Um, you know, what is a strong password? People have different ideas of what a strong password is. Uh, and then you have this problem where the password files could potentially be subverted, could be stolen. Um, and there's just lots of lots of challenges with passwords. It would be nice to just find some cool way to completely get away from passwords. And so, um, and, and it's also a user experience kind of a thing, right? So, um, on my, uh, you know, I have, I have an older iPhone, but it's one that I uses, um, thumbprint for authentication and it's a lot easier than typing in you know whatever the passcode is every time I have to get access to it I just you know push on the start button and it takes you know it reads my fingerprint and I'm in um, so so the user experience is a lot better but but I think what people have to understand is that that could potentially reduce um, the security level if you're not fully confident in um, that the, the mechanism is actually you know Record, ensuring that it's only going to open to your thumbprint, for example. In fact, there's a cool Mythbusters episode from several years ago where um, the Mythbusters basically take a fingerprint off of a, a drinking glass from one of the Mythbusters. Um, Grant Grant Imahara is one of the one of the guys that was on the old myth the old Mythbusters show, and um, <clears throat> so you know he he um, used his thumbprint to uh, associate with a couple of different biometric. A thumbprint biometric devices. One was a door lock that you put on a on a you know a thumbprint door lock basically. So you put it on a um, you know it was the whole locking mechanism on a on like an office door. And then the other biometric was a um, thumbprint reader that would give him access to a computer system. And so then you know the team uh, um, you know they didn't take a thumbprint directly from him. They took a thumbprint from a drinking glass to sort of make it realistic. And then they were able to. Um, <clears throat> enhance that thumbprint in different ways uh, in order to make it um, trigger these biometric, these thumbprint systems. And, um, it were, you know, they were able to get both of these things to unlock using, using a th different types of fake thumbprints. You know, one of them was just one that they, um, you know, they basically took the thumbprint, they, they, ex they made it bigger on a photocopier, traced it to make it more, um, more, um, you know, readable sort of, um, more clear Then they shrunk it down again to the right size. And then they, then they ran it on you know, these different systems and it opened some of them and not others. And then they did another thing where they created a 3d silicone, you know, basically finger, you know, it was really a real ridged fingerprint. And then they put it over somebody's 
thumb so that it got the heat signature from the person's thumb. A lot of these biometric systems won't work if they don't um, recognize the heat that would go along with your, your finger. Um, anyway, between those two different ways, they were able to unlock um, these different thumbprint systems. So, so um, <clears throat> just be aware that, that the, these systems might be a little bit less secure than, um, than you might think they would be. Um, so here's a side note I put on the bottom of this slide. Fifth Amendment can protect you. The Fifth Amendment protects you from having to hand over a passcode for your phone, right? So, so um, if if um, you know people who are who are arrested, um, Fifth Amendment uh, protects them from uh, self-incrimination, from saying things that will incriminate themselves, and. Um, if, uh, so if the police asks you for the passcode for your telephone, you can refuse to give that information, uh, um, citing the fifth amendment. Historically, it's been, it, 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 this has not been true for biometrics. So the police have been able to, um, uh, basically compel people to use their thumbprint to unlock their phone because um, that's not information that is protected by the Fifth Amendment. That is a uh, physical property of your person. And um, so, so again, historically, the case has been that um, the police could not compel you to, um, or the, the police could compel you to use either, a, you know, whatever face ID or a thumbprint to, to unlock a device. Um, where they wouldn't have been able to do that if you're just using a passcode entry. This actually just changed like yesterday, believe it or not. Um, and I, I say changed, uh, I should clarify and say that um, <clears throat> what actually happened was a uh, judge, a federal judge in California made this ruling. Um, basically, uh, there was a case before um, Judge Candace Westmore who uh, um, was being asked by prosecutor by prosecutors to uh, to uh, basically issue a search warrant in which um, they asked him to compel individuals to to use face ID or other biometrics to unlock devices and apparently this is a thing that is, has been routine in the past um, and in this case Judge Westmore refused and basically said that. Um, Here's a, this quote here, I think is interesting. Courts have an obligation to safeguard constitutional rights, cannot permit those rights to be diminished merely due to the advancement of technology, right? So basically what the judge is saying is that just because there's a different process now for gaining uh, or for, for conducting this authentication step, that shouldn't protect people's constitutional rights. So, um, so this could change, you know, this is, uh, you know, could get overturned at some level and, and we go kind of go back to the way things were yesterday, which was um, the world in which um, police could, ha could uh, have a warrant issued and cause you to have to use biometrics to unlock a device if that device is configured to do that. But, um, but if this uh, judge's ruling can, becomes uh, you know, standard case law, then that will no longer be the case. So sort of an interesting uh, bit of trivia. Somebody's not muted, so I'm gonna mute people who are online here. Give me a second. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so um, another bit of uh, <clears throat> interesting news. This is, um, this transpired over the last week or so. And I've talked about cryptocurrency um, once or twice before in these forums. And I, really, I probably should do a weekly workshop on blockchain and cryptocurrency is kind of interesting um, developments. Um, just so people kind of have a basic understanding of how they work. This particular news item is about um, this cryptocurrency called Ethereum. So we've all, I'm sure, heard of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is the, the first uh, cryptocurrency and um, still, uh, I'm sure, worth the most and probably the most popular. Um, but there are other cryptocurrencies out there. Actually, there are dozens, per perhaps hundreds of other cryptocurrencies. One of them uh, is Ethereum. And this is, this is pretty high on the list in terms of, of uh, the different cryptocurrencies. And there was this um, case last week where um, Coinbase, which is, uh, which is a, a um, website that uh, allows people to buy and sell cryptocurrencies, uh, Coinbase suspended Ethereum Classic. So that's, Ethereum Classic is a particular branch of Ethereum um, after a blockchain history rewrite. And um, so basically what happened was the blockchain was rewritten back several uh, blocks in the chain and um, 
And when that happens, um, first of all, it's not supposed to happen, right? So, so um, what Ethereum saw, second bullet here, Ethereum crypto cryptocurrency saw 100 blocks reorganized on January 7th, included about half a million dollars in double spends. So $460,000 in double spends. And since cryptocurrency is designed, most almost all cryptocurrency is designed to be anonymous, you can't see who double spent. And um, so this is, a, this is a thing that should not happen in any cryptocurrency, it shouldn't happen in any blockchain. Um, you know, blockchains are built using this consensus mechanism. And <clears throat> what, what that means is that there are many people mining uh, the, the particular cryptocurrency around the world. And, um, and there's no single, um, there's no central authority, right? So, so, so Bitcoin, other, other coins, Ethereum uh, are uh, distributed and that's a feature, right? So the whole intent of, of blockchain is that it's a di this distributed ledger. There's no central authority. There's no central location where somebody could sort of change the truth, right? So right now blockchain is being seen as a way to, um, um, you know, have complete open auditability by recording data in a way that's completely distributed. So no central authority could, could, you know, sort of change the records and, and say that, you know, um, something happened that didn't happen or, or, you know, from a, from a bank perspective, from a monetary perspective, they say, well, you know, a bank could get hacked and somebody could change who has which money. And that could never happen in um, cryptocurrency because of this distributed ledger, right? This, this ledger is uh, recorded by people all over the world. Um, and that's generally true unless somebody owns f more than half of the computing power that is devoted to uh, creating that ledger. And if somebody owns more than half the computing power to that, that's creating the, the, the blockchain, then they can make that blockchain say whatever they want. And so I've got a couple of figures here on the right side um, to try to kind of lay out um, what happened. Uh, and there's a great article uh, that I that I linked to down at the bottom of the slide, medium.com slash uh, coinmonk slash what is a 51% attack or a double spend attack. So if you just Google for medium.com and 51% attack, you'll get this, um, this story that uh, gives a little bit of a taste of how the distributed lecture ledger functions and then talks about how this 50%, 51% attack could be carried out. Basically, if you look at the top figure, what you have is you have the blockchain that is that is trooping along, you know, transactions being grouped into blocks. So a transaction is somebody spending Bitcoin. So so Bitcoin, or in this case Ethereum, moving from one uh, um, wallet to another wallet, and um, you know, so a bunch of transactions are put into a block, and then. Um, that block is is um, hashed, and then you move on to the next block. So you, we have block 38, 39, and then 40, and this all happens in, in a distributed fashion. And everybody agrees on this block before the next block is created. And um, so it, you just sort of move up the chain here. What, what an attacker can do who owns more than half of the computing power um, devoted to that particular uh, cryptocurrency can create essentially fake blocks block 39, here we have block 40, block 41. And what the attacker does is they, is they create these blocks, but they don't advertise them to the rest of the network. So you might have, you know, 100,000 um, people creating, you know, these blocks, right? You have 100,000 people in a network, in, in the distributed network creating these blocks. But if this malicious person has 101,000 persons worth of computing power, then they can create their own their own blockchain that that essentially branches off and mirrors the the correct blockchain that the one that's agreed upon by uh, the, the the general public and they're all advertising that blockchain to each other where the attacker is not um, advertising their branch so then then what what the attacker does here in the second uh, picture is you see in block 40 here the attacker sp spent a hundred bitcoin and in their own uh, um, branched blockchain, the attacker didn't spend their 100 Bitcoin. And so now you have this, this um, thing that the, that the person purchased, maybe they, uh, maybe they exchanged 100 Bitcoin for cash, right? So now they have the cash in their pocket. <clears throat> and now what they do in the, what's shown in the bottom picture, they're still building this blockchain, you know, sort of parallel to the, to the correct blockchain using their massive computing power. 
And then what happens in the bottom picture is um, they uh, compute a uh, block that's past the true or, or the distributed block chain. And when they do that, they advertise this new block to everybody. And now that new blockchain can be validated back to its source. And it's been uh, contributed to by uh, more than half of the, of the um, community, remember, because they own 101K worth of uh, compute power while these other people only have 100K. And so because their uh, blockchain is uh, agreed upon by more than half of the distributed network, um, their blockchain becomes real. And when their blockchain becomes real, that $100 that was spent on the old blockchain is no longer spent. It's now the fake zero Bitcoin spent that's reflected in their, in their uh, branched chain. So um, I don't know if that was a good explanation or not, but essentially what it means is that somebody can uh, now has that, uh, now that as far as the blockchain is concerned, that 100 Bitcoin was not spent and it's still in their wallet and they can go spend it on some, something else. And again, because this whole thing is anonymous, one of the features is an anonymity. Because it's all anonymous, you can't identify who that person is, or you, you're not supposed to be able to identify who that person is unless they reveal themselves, which turns out that a lot of people mistakenly reveal themselves. Um, you know, that's how lot, lots of um, criminals get caught who are using Bitcoin to buy and sell things, but that's sort of a completely separate uh, discussion. Anyway, so this thing happened in the Ethereum blockchain. Don't know what they're going to do. Um, it's tough. It's a tough problem. This has happened before in, you know, it's happened um, many times in different um, cryptocurrencies. Um, the, you know, the question now is right now they've essentially frozen the Ethereum blockchain, or at least that's what they did several days ago. The question now is what do they do? Do they just continue on with this? What is now the, the, um, the, the no kidding, correct um, blockchain or another thing they can do is they can roll this whole thing back back to block 38 and essentially say none of this stuff ever happened. But if they do that, then there's a whole bunch of blockchain that changed hands potentially for products that people have now exchanged um, in all these other blocks. And the fact that this was rolled back by a hundred blocks, that's pretty significant. Um, you know, that's not like a, that's not like a, a couple of minutes worth of transactions that could be days or weeks or, um, worth of transactions. So, this is one of the challenges in, in uh, any cryptocurrency. This kind of an attack was predicted in the original um, in the original blockchain paper back um, whenever that was, 2007, 2008. Um, and people sort of poo-pooed it and said, well, there's no way somebody could, could have more than half of the computing power um, in, in a cryptocurrency. But uh, essentially over time, that's proven not to be the case. So um, interesting cryptocurrency news. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's it for, uh, for current news stories. And uh, what I'm going to do now is um, transition into our topic du jour, which is reconnaissance and scanning. <clears throat> okay, so um, this uh, particular lesson is out of um, the cyber basics. My pen's not working all of a sudden. Cyber Basics, and it's a module. I don't remember what module it is, but it's on. Uh, I think it's build hacking module four, maybe. I don't know. Um, and so it's the first lesson in that module. And so um, learning objectives. We want to describe techniques for passive network uh, reconnaissance, define sweeping, scanning, OS fingerprinting, and banner grabbing, and then we'll define uh, war driving and war dialing. And so these are different ways that um, a, an attacker can um, get information about a potential target, right? So this, th this discussion about, about reconnaissance and network scanning is, um, this is about getting students to uh, you know, think like the adversary, right? So, um, so um, we we think of if somebody's going to attack a network, if we're going to if we if we try to think about how how somebody is going to come at our network, we think about the five P's: probe, penetrate, persist, propagate, and then profit. And here are the P's, right? Probe. First thing they're going to do is is to conduct reconnaissance, and and you can think of. Um, um, from a military perspective, you know, so I'm, so I'm a, um, 
have military background and if you're going to conduct any sort of uh, uh, attack or defense, first thing you want to do is is do some reconnaissance and understand, um, you know, the terrain on which you're going to operate, understand your adversary, um, et cetera. And so the, this whole this whole reconnaissance uh, activity is about understanding the adversary. And in this case, again, we're taking this from a from an offensive perspective. We're thinking about how somebody might approach um, attacking my network. So first step is to to do this. Um, passive and active reconnaissance. And then we're gonna to try to penetrate the network. We're gonna to try to gain persistence. We're gonna propagate, that means to branch out to other portions of the network, and then we're gonna achieve some goals. But uh, the focus of today is the reconnaissance. Hey, what, what, are we gonna, what are we gonna recon, right? We're gonna conduct reconnaissance. What does that mean? Um, well, if you're thinking, you know, if, you're, if you were to put yourself in, a, in um, an attacker's perspective, you know, you want to gain uh, unauthorized access to, um, you know, maybe a bank's network. So you're a bad guy, you're going to rob a bank using their network. Um, what, what information might be useful in order for you to do that? Well, there's lots of information about the organization that you might find useful. Um, names of people in the organization, phone numbers, email addresses. You know, what, what are those going to be used for? Well, um, those are all great um, for social engineering, right? If you want to uh, trick somebody's um, uh, administrative assistant into uh, changing uh, or into giving you the their, their boss's password, for example, or you want to, you know, trick the IT guy into changing the CEO's password. Um, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, there's lots of, different social engineering attacks that you might uh, that you might perpetuate by gaining information about names, phone numbers, email addresses, you know, and just who's who in the organization. Um, you know, diagrams of the network, procedures and policies, you know, what, what policies are in place that you might be able to circumvent. Um, you know, hacking is thinking all about how to get around some problem and some of those problems are technical problems and some of those problems are, are you know, related to, to policy and standard operating procedures and that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so information about the organization is, is helpful to have. And I'll, I'll give just one example of, of um, this sort of an, uh, the, you know, an attack based on this information being perpetuated um, here at the university here at Virginia Tech. Um, we've, we've seen uh, several of these attacks um, recently, and I'm going to pull up a slide here that I'm going to use um, in a talk I have to give later this week, if I can find my slide. Um, so here's an email that was received by uh, somebody in the organization. Um, this, so this particular one is from September. We got several, we had reports of several of these over the holidays. Um, this is an email to, to uh, um, an entire department and the sender was um, the department head. It wasn't really the department head, but the sender's email address was spoofed. The, the, uh, the um, sending address was spoofed, which is um, not too hard to pull off. And this is what the, you know, this, this email starts out like this. I'm in a meeting right now. I'm contacting you. I should have called you. Phone is not allowed during the meeting. Um, I need you to help me on something very important right away. And then um, when you when people answer this, which we had people answer this, what do you need? Um, the attacker comes back and says, I need you to go buy um, gift cards. I need you to go buy Amazon gift cards and, um, you know, whatever. They'll specify the kinds of gift cards. And then um, when you get them, I need you to give me the numbers off the gift cards so that I can use them right away. And... Um, and so what does an attacker have to do to pull something off like this? Well, they, they, they certainly want to make the, um, the person think that they're being asked to do this by somebody in their food chain, right? Somebody that they report to or somebody important in the organization. So, um, so they, they select people that have authority in a particular organization. And in this case, um, there were a couple of academic departments at the university that this happened to and, and uh, some other offices. Um, and so that requires a certain level of reconnaissance, right, by, by somebody to, to um, by an attacker to do this analysis of the organization and try to figure out who's who and, you know, who, who might um, somebody listen to and, and um, you know, follow those kinds of instructions. So organizational information is, is, um, is uh, important a lot of times. You also want to know 
um, what kinds of computers are used in the organization, what, what operating systems are used, you know, the version numbers, the patch levels, um, and why do you want to know that? Well, if you're going to attack a, uh, a computer system based on particular vulnerabilities, then you need to know um, what computer systems are used in the organization. Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, so at, at um, some universities, um, they use, like at Virginia Tech, for example, we use lots of Windows systems, we use lots of um, uh, Mac systems, and, and they're used for different things, right? So, so um, you know, departments and offices, some of them are, are sort of more Mac oriented, some of them are more Windows oriented. And if you're going to attack a particular department, you, you don't want to waste your, your Mac uh, um, exploits on Windows vulnerabilities, because it'll never work. So, if you're going to attack an organization, helps to know what operating systems they use, and it's super helpful to know what version of the operating system. So are they using, are they using Windows 10 or Windows 7, or you know, are they still using Windows XP, which believe it or not, lots of people still are. Um, and uh, what's the, you know, what's the patch level? Are they, have they been patched recently? And then um, what services are offered within the organization, right? Are they, do, you know, they have a website? Do they have, um, do they have um, you know, do they set up SSH on their uh, servers so that people can g get access to them remotely? Um, do they have SQL servers, you know, database servers? Um, you know, what services are being offered? And then if you can find out what the version of the of that particular service is and what's the what the patch level is, um, that, that's pretty useful. And we'll talk about how to get some of that information. And then how's the network laid out, right? What, what, are, what rules are on their firewall? Um, you know, what kind of an intrusion detection system are they using? If you know that uh, organizations are using a particular intrusion detection system, then you can do some research and identify what kinds of attacks that IDS will identify and what kinds of attacks that um, that particular IDS may not be able to identify. So these are the kinds of things that we want to get um, about uh, an organization and their network. And there are different ways to do that. Um, you can uh, you can do lots of neat things with Google. Um, that's probably the number one tool for reconnaissance, quite frankly. Um, you can do you can do DNS zone transfer. So this is where we grab information about um, uh, systems in the organization. Um, we've talked a little bit about the domain name service, and that um, lets us pair um, a particular system name with an IP address. So, for example, uh, www.vt.edu, right? That, that, that's a particular system uh, on the university, and um, we can align that with an IP address. If I can do a DNS zone transfer of the Virginia Tech uh, DNS uh, zone, then I can uh, get the IP address and name of every system uh, in that in that DNS, uh, you know, all, all, essentially all the servers that are on the university, of which there are uh, many, many hundreds. Um, and, you know, if I'm an attacker, um, you know, that, that gives me my list of things that I'm going to try to attack, right? Um, uh, war driving is another passive uh, uh, technique. We'll take a look at that. OS fingerprinting, we'll take a look at that. Um, and then there's active things that you can do. Social, you know, social engineering. This is where I'm calling up the the, um, you know, the help desk and, and, you know, asking them for information. Um, you know, I can, I can sweep or scan the network or I can do war dialing. So, so generally passive uh, kinds of attacks are things that um, don't, um, you know, where I'm not, I'm not interacting with any device or any person in the organization. I'm simply asking for, you know, I'm gathering information for, in a completely passive way. Um, where, whereas uh, active reconnaissance is, uh, is where I'm interacting with people or, or systems in the organization. So, um, so Google hacking is a, is a, a pretty powerful technique. You, you, you know, you can use Google in ways that most people don't use Google on a daily basis. Um, uh, so, so the Google, so, so the way Google and other search engines work is they, um, they're constantly trolling the, the internet, the exposed internet, and they um, basically create a database of all the stuff that they find. And then when you do a search, you're not actually, you know, you, when you do a Google search, you're not um, actually touching any systems on the internet. You're simply interacting with a database that, uh, that is the Google, um, Google database. But this thing is updated constantly, right? So they have these web crawlers that are out there crawling constantly. It has an index of every linked website. So there's, you may have heard of this uh, notion of, of the dark web. 
Um, those are things that are not cataloged by Google because they're not linked by other websites. Um, but the Google index has every has an index of, of all sort of public linked websites and it caches the first um, uh, 101 kilobytes of data from, from each one of the pages. This number actually may be bigger now. Um, and you can, do, you can use some advanced operators, right? So usually when we use Google, we just type in some search term and then, and then we come back with, um, with uh, you know, uh, web pages that are related to that specific search term. In this one, we can, what you can actually do in Google is you can use advanced operators. Like here I can do this thing where I say in URL and then I put in quotes, view frame, question mark, mode equals. And if I do that, I'm going to do it actually. If I do that, so I'm using this in URL um, operator. Let's see if I can open up my Googler. All right, here's Google, and I'm going to paste that in there. <clears throat> and um, so here's what I get. This very top link returned to me. This is an IP address, 184.132.183.28.12. Uh, four, the 4,000 is the port number. And if I click on that, this, oh, this is somebody's webcam in their yard. Wow, that's kind of creepy. I'm going to close that. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's, uh, You know, you can find stuff like this. Um, I'm sure there's more of these. Um, I don't know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna search through them, but um, earlier today I found several. Um, yeah, so that was somebody's web camera in their, in their backyard, right? And if you knew the IP range in which you wanted to search, then you could search for all um, uh, IP cameras in a specific, uh, range of, of um, IP addresses, uh, for example, which could be, could give you some really interesting data. I mean, you might be able to get back the webcams that uh, monitor the, the front entrance. Um, and then if once you know the computer that runs the webcam that monitors the front entrance of the, of the bank, then maybe you could do something to subvert uh, that computer and cause that uh, webcam to, to stop functioning. Um, so kind of, kind of interesting. <clears throat> Lots of different Google hacking you can do. There are a couple of different websites that provide more information about Google hacking, but if you, if you Google Google hacking, um, you might find a lot of stuff. So at the bottom here, I, I list uh, this particular website, offensivesecurity.com, whoops, um, community projects, Google hacking database. And this pro provides lots of these different Google hacks. That's just one of them. Google, lots of great information. Okay, there's, there's this, um, there's this project called Shodan that um, catalogs things that are not websites. Um, and uh, so, um, so it will find things like, um, it'll find IP cameras, like, like I, you know, I was just able to pull up in Google. Um, it it uh, can find things like industrial control systems that are connected to the internet. So, um, um, uh, you know, industrial control systems are things like uh, HVAC systems in a building or, um, you know, monitoring systems for um, power generation sites, um, you know, all kinds of different um, things like that. Um, yeah, so Shodan just finds all kinds of stuff that's not a website that's connected to the internet. And um, it, it's actually based on, on a, on a um, security researchers sort of weekend project and, um, you know, he, he put this, he basically took some uh, web search engine software and he tweaked it a little bit to, to um, do things, um, you know, to, to find things that weren't web pages, look for other protocols um, and, uh, and ended up um, turning it into a pretty lucrative business. So, so he runs this uh, Shodan.io and, and on Shodan, you can do um, searches yourself. Uh, for free, so you can do you can do like low volume searches uh, for free. 
but if you want to do lots of searches, then you have to have um, you have to pay for an account. So the you know search engine for Internet of Things, search engine for security, um, search engine for whatever else. And so so one way that this might be useful uh, to an organization is they might um, I might put in vt.edu for example, and I can search and I can find um, things that are not web pages that are on the the um, that might be on the Virginia Tech network. And um, some stuff comes up here. I'm not gonna drill into it, but uh, what is this stuff? Um, yeah, it looks like uh, it's property of Virginia Tech, unauthorized access or violation of the university policy. What that is, when I eight two three. Uh, oh, NTP, oh, NTP server. So this is a time server. Yeah, so this serves up um, network time protocol. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, so lots of int interesting information you can get from this kind of a tool and you can look for specific ports and protocols and, and get some pretty detailed information about what kinds of systems a particular organization uh, is running. And again, if you know the range of IP addresses of the organization, then, um, or if you know the domain name of the organization, then you can find stuff that's directly related to that organization. More, more passive reconnaissance. Um, Internet Archive is kind of a fun uh, tool. Um, so um, the Wayback Machine, you'll hear, you'll hear people call it. So if you go to www.archive.org, you can look at um, old web pages for organizations dating back to the early 1990s, right? So this particular uh, image screenshot is a web is is the uh, lookup for um, what's oh, it's, I guess USMA.edu USMA United States Military Academy.edu um, and so if you go to the Internet Archive and you put in uh, USMA.edu then you'll see all of the old USMA.edu web pages dating back to uh, 1996. Um, and you can do this for any organization and see their old web pages dating back for years. And and so if you want to see, for example, in an organization, you know, who um, who the key players were a year ago, um, you know, maybe maybe names have changed. Um, you want to know how long somebody's been in an organization, you can look at old versions of the web pages and see if you can find their their uh, personnel listings and that kind of stuff. So this can be useful. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so war drive war driving is this um, technique where you can uh, drive around uh, with with particular software on your um, laptop and generally you use a high gain antenna for something like this but what you can do is you can identify um, access points wireless access points in a particular location and um, somebody might use this outside of a building uh, to identify um, wireless access points that uh, that are that are in the building and try to identify um, APs that are that are uh, un unsecured or weakly secured um, DNS so we've talked about DNS hierarchical distributed database that maps domain names and host names to IP addresses and um, within a particular organization. So here, you know, so here I show um, from the root, um, now my pen stopped working again. From the DNS root, I can, um, I can get down to .com and then Microsoft.com and then um, inside of Microsoft, I may be able to identify a bunch of different individual systems. And so if I'm gonna do something malicious to Microsoft, it would be helpful to, um, to be able to pluck out the, the host names of all those devices and what their IP addresses are. So this zone transfer is, is the process by which I can grab that information from a particular DNS server. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but you can sort of read through this at your leisure. Or dialing, um, this, is a little, this is sort of old school, used to find modems and fax machines. Those things, believe it or not, still exist. And so basically a war dialer is a piece of software that will dial a range of phone numbers and then it disconnects after a ring or two, but, um, but it, it's um, used to identify again, fax machines and, uh, and um, modems, which still exist. And um, interesting tr bit of trivia there. This was, this was one of the first uh, things that the, that the group anonymous did um, back in 2008, they were um, they had this vendetta against the Church of Scientology, and so they used a war dialer to identify fax machines in various 
Church of Scientology locations around the world and then, you know, sent a bunch of, um, you know, malicious faxes to them. Um, okay, in social engineering, again, this is where we manipulate manipulate people into divulging um, information that uh, you know that maybe otherwise they wouldn't uh, be inclined to to, to divulge. Um, so you're going to use um, you know use information gained from from reconnaissance methods that we've talked about, and then. Um, Typically, the ingress for most successful and damaging attacks on on our networks, and so um, you know, speaking for Virginia Tech at least, um, you know, there's lots of social engineering that leads to um, to um, you know bad things happening on our networks. Phone spoofing. Um, this is a particular uh, tool that can be used in social engineering. You may you may see this um, on your own phone. Um, you know, so you get calls that are spoofed from other particular phone numbers. Uh, you know, this is used a lot by um, by telemarketers, uh, but can also be used. You, you know, telemarketers generally use this to spoof uh, particular regions, right? So if they know that you live in Blacksburg, Virginia, then they'll then they'll you know call from a five four zero area code phone number and make you think that it's somebody in town when really they're calling from some other city or country. Um, but you can actually uh, use sp phone spoofing to um, spoof a particular phone number, and it's surprisingly easy. So here's a website where you can uh, go do that, right? Spoofcard.com. Um, easily disguise your caller ID, display a different number to protect yourself or to pull a prank uh, or to scam somebody, right? Easy to do, works on any phone. Might cost you a few bucks. <clears throat> um, so now we'll talk about some active scanning techniques. I'm gonna um, try to wrap this up before too long. Um, but you can reach out and try to touch systems on a network using a tool like a ping, ICMP ping. And uh, let me pull up a uh, command. Pull up a terminal window. So here I'm, I'm in Windows and I'm gonna, um, I'm on a terminal and I'm gonna ping uh, CNN com, And what I get back is, um, I get back, uh, so when I, so th this tells me that that system is, is alive and answering, um, uh, you know, requests for, for, um, some service. In this case, I'm just sending it a, a you know, I'm just basically asking if it's alive. Um, okay. So how could this be useful to an attacker? Well, I can, I can ping, uh, particular IP addresses, and um, and if I know the range of IP addresses that a that a organization um, uses, then I can um, I can uh, ping each one of those IP addresses in succession, and uh, with that I can identify live systems on the network, and those any you know any system that's a live system is something that I that I can explore further to try to attack. So ping is, is, uh, can be useful to identify live systems on a network. Um, next here is Traceroute. So what Traceroute does is it, um, it provides um, each of the hops between uh, your system and the target system. And so if I want to, for example, identify um, you know what? Which what's what's the ISP that's you know what's the next hop out of a particular organization's network? I can do a trace route and identify each hop between me and the target system, and I know um, you know somebody in between me and them that I may be able to uh, you know subvert or you know use to to um, eavesdrop on communications or or whatever. So this screenshot is from a trace route against Microsoft.com. Uh, network network sweeping is um, is a this notion of of pinging um, a whole range of IP addresses, and so I provide a little script here where I can where I can ping a range of of IP addresses all at once instead of having to type in each address individually. Um, <clears throat> scanning is is you know so we we know that uh, individual systems are identified by individual IP addresses um, and um, Different services are identified um, 
by port numbers on those IP addresses. And so if I know active IP addresses in a particular network, then I can um, use tools to do a port scan. And with those port scans, I can identify live hosts or I can identify services that are running on those IP addresses. So I can, I can figure out which systems are, um, might be web servers. I can figure out which systems might be, um, you know, database servers or uh, uh, SSH, you know, secure shell servers or, you know, uh, protocols, services that the organization may not want me to know. <clears throat> and the, the primary tool that we use to do these kinds of scans is called NMAP, Network Map. Um, full service tool for active scanning of networks. This, this like many of the tools that we talk about is, um, you know, can be used for, um, for um, malicious purposes or, you know, that can be used for, you know, by, by people who are troubleshooting the network to like fix problems and that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the ping command is used, you know, by, by uh, network system administrators constantly, you know, when, when you're configuring a network or if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem in a network, then, you know, the first thing you're going to try to do is ping the host that you're trying to get to and make sure that it's alive and answering. And then, you know, then after that, you're gonna, you might do an NMAP scan with some different flags to try to identify whether the, you know, the web server you're trying to get to is still alive or not. Um, so these are all tools that are used by system, system ins on a regular basis to do, um, to do uh, things they should be doing, but they can also be used, of course, for malicious purposes by, by uh, malicious people or by penetration testers who are getting paid to test the security of other people's network. So we'll do some hands-on NMAP next week. I'm not gonna do that right now. All kinds of different NMAP scans you can do. And uh, th you know, doing different kinds of scans can give you different kinds of information about a particular network. Uh, OS fingerprinting is, um, this, is this um, way that you can identify specific operating systems that are running on a, uh, on a computer that you're that you're um, interacting with. And, um, you know, the reason this works is because, um, you know, different operating systems um, implement different network protocols in a slightly different way because, um, you know, most of the implementation is, is required to, to be, a, a specific, be done a specific way. But uh, in some cases, the, um, you know, the person writing the, the network portion of the operating system, um, you know, sort of has to make, stuff up and uh, if you know um, the different characteristics of different operating systems and how their network stacks are, are created then you can um, do this OS fingerprinting thing and of course this is no, nothing that you would actually um, do yourself based on your knowledge you would use software that that does this for you and so nmap will do some OS fingerprinting and it'll try to identify particular operating systems that are running on on hosts um, if you give it the right flags so we'll do that next week uh, and then banner grabbing is where, um, you know, the interaction between a um, web server and a web client, for example, um, exchanges some information about the browser, you know, so, so when you connect to a website, the browser tells it information about the computer system and about the browser that's being used. And so you, so you may have noticed that sometimes you go to a website and it knows what browser you're using or it knows what operating system you're using. Um, like if you go to a software download site, it'll say, oh, you need the Windows version of this or you need the Mac version of this. Um, that's because your web browser is telling them that. The same is true in the other direction. So when you connect to a web server, the server tells the browser information about the server um, because it may, it may help the browser uh, interact with the server a little bit more efficiently. So here's an example of that. Here's me doing a, a, a banner grab against um, a web server um, that I uh, maintain. And um, in the banner here, it says the server is Apache 2.4.10, which is a particular uh, web server software. And that Apache web server software is running on an Ubuntu system. So um, for an attacker, that's a lot of good information. You know, I know that, I know that not only that this is Apache web server, but I know the specific version of Apache that's running. And so, um, and so I can then tailor an attack against that specific software and that specific version. Um, so a lot of people, when they spin up their web servers, they'll actually uh, change the configuration of their web server to, to spit out um, false information in the banners. Okay, and that wraps it for the week. Um, and I'm almost right on time, which is uh, unusual. So, so um, 
thanks for joining us today. We're, it was all about uh, sort of talking through um, reconnaissance and scanning, you know, why, why you might do it, what, in what context um, an attacker might use these kinds of techniques against you. Um, and then what we'll do next week is we'll spend a little bit of time uh, doing, you know, using some of these uh, in a hands-on way. So we'll do some hands-on um, NMAP scans and, and other kinds of scans using uh, Virginia Cyber Range systems. And then uh, following that, we'll start getting into uh, web server um, or web application attacks. All right, so thanks for joining us. See you next week.